Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Deadly suicide bombing outside foreign ministry in Kabul kill at least 20 people. Taliban bans female patients from seeking medical treatment from male doctors. And India at UN says nations using cross-border terror must be held accountable. Let's begin the show with Afghanistan, where a suicide bomb attack outside the Afghan foreign ministry in Kabul has caused heavy casualties. According to several media reports, at least 20 civilians have been killed and the local offshoot of the Islamic State group known as the ISISK have taken responsibility for the attack. A report. A deadly bombing killed at least 20 people near the foreign ministry in the Afghan capital, Kabul. The Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the bombing, which was the second major attack in Kabul in 2023 and drew condemnation from the international community. The extremist group said in a statement that the martyr doom seeker, it identified as Khyber al Kandahari, detonated his explosive vest amidst a gathering of ministry employees and guards as they left through the ministry's main gate. The extremists have increased their assault since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan in 2021. Targets have included Taliban patrols and members of the country's Shiite minority. The repeated blasts exposed the hollow claims of the Taliban-led government about the improved security infrastructure of the country. Hundreds of common people have died in such explosions carried out by armed groups linked to the Islamic State. You see, Taliban has been a fighting force all along. And at this stage, they need to learn how to govern. And that has been their major challenge. Now, as we know, that there are large number of groups because Taliban is also not a homogeneous entity. And therefore, what we see is that there, is, there are many challenges that it is facing. It is still waiting for recognition from the world. It is also uh, hoping that it will continue to receive the funding that has been committed so that it can also provide relief to the people. But till then, the more and more people will get disenchanted. And therefore, in order to keep them under control, it needs to refurbish its training programs, its forces, and also to change them into a security force rather than an attacking force, the way they have been working as a guerrilla warfare. ISIS terrorists in Afghanistan first came to global attention when it carried out a massive suicide bombing attack at one of the gates near Kabul airport, killing a large number of people. Since then, the group has carried out a string of attacks in different parts of the country. The violence has fueled fears that Afghanistan could collapse into anarchy and even return to a new phase of civil war. The Islamic State group's attacks, coupled with a spiraling economic crisis, have caused mounting concern over the future stability of the country. But the problem is that now with the Russia-Ukraine crisis, obviously the focus on Afghanistan or any other war is much less. And that is the pity of it all. And this has been often mentioned by our leadership as well. That they create problems and then they leave them. And that is not good. So Taliban is today looking for some kind of engagement with the world powers, especially with the major powers and the neighboring powers. But what we are seeing is if they are not addressed well quickly, we'll be seeing them totally going into the Chinese hands. And that may not be very good for the region and for the world. Islamic State has viewed the Taliban as its strategic rival. The militants of this terror outfit consider the Taliban as filthy nationalists who have betrayed the greater Islamic cause. They see the Taliban as another kind of political outfit cutting deals with the Americans that is ideologically not pure as per ISIS. 
The brutal jihadi group's fight against the Taliban is entering a new phase and analysts believe that in the coming days, this rivalry will take more violent form. On one hand, the war-torn country is always at risk from terrorism. On the other, the Taliban's tight limitations have gripped the nation. The hardliners have deprived millions of Afghan women of their right to education, ousted tens of thousands of women from jobs and banned women businesses and all sorts of activism. They have trampled on Afghan women today and forced them back into dark ages. In the latest, the Taliban in Balkh province have said female patients should not visit male doctors. Let's take a closer look at what this actually means. A brave woman in Afghanistan with a child in her hand could be seen writing education, work, freedom on a wall. She is among the millions of Afghan women who can no longer work in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. Women in the country are now using graffiti as a form of protest. Since resting power in August 2021, the Taliban have systematically snatched away the freedom and rights of women in the country. In the latest, Taliban issued a new ruling in Balkh province stating that Afghan women are not allowed to visit male doctors. According to media reports, the decree directs hospitals to ensure that male doctors do not treat female patients. The country's female medical professionals and students are fearing that women will lose their lives for the lack of medical supervision. Women have equal rights in any country and in any society. There is no religious or legal document which prohibits this. The Taliban on the other hand claim that they are ruling Afghanistan as by Sharia, whereas there is no restriction on women's education and equal rights in the Sharia as well. So they are just following their own dogmatic, extremely conservative and heretic ideologies, which are not in tune with the universal human rights in the country. Despite the international community having highlighted to them from time to time, including the Organization for Islamic Cooperation only recently, there has been no change in the attitude of the Taliban. The Taliban claimed under its rule, this time women would be accorded every right within the confines of Sharia law. However, in the months that have followed, the de facto rulers have imposed harsh restrictions on women's education and their access to employment. In December last year, the Taliban banned women aid workers after claiming that women are not wearing their hijabs properly. It is obvious that ban places further limitations on a woman's capacity to sustain herself. The United Nations is trying to get the Taliban to reverse its ban on women aid workers. They argue that women are needed to deliver aid to other women as the Taliban rule prevents women from meeting men who they are not related to. This means aid agencies staffed by men will not be able to reach many who are in need of care. This means women would be deprived of aid during a food crisis. واقعاتش در طول سال موجود است متاسفانه در واقعاتی که هوا سرد میشه واقعات زیادتر میشه اگر هوا بسیار کثیف میشه واقعات زیادتر میشه کسایی که اقتصاد ضعیف دارن کسایی که نمیتونه خانه خود خوب گرم بکنه در زمستان کالای گرم بر اطفال خود بپوشانند کسایی که اطفال خود واکسین نمیکنن این در مجموع یک گروپ از اطفال Afghanistan is the only country in the world where girls are banned from going to high schools and effectively banned from political participation. Today they have imposed a primitive government with harsh rules 
erasing centuries of female progress. The hardliners have denied millions of women the right to an education, fired tens of thousands of women from government jobs, and outlawed their businesses and various forms of activism. A recent analysis by the UN Children's Fund found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost, costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finished secondary school and entered the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least $5.4 billion. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, their contribution is headed towards zero. India has emphasized on peaceful settlements of disputes, application and strengthening of the rule of law at the United Nations Security Council. Underscoring the importance of the application of rule of law, in that the United Nations has stated that the international level should protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states from aggression, including cross-border terrorism. Take a look. India continues its strong and focused commitment to help UN member states build capacity to prevent and counter terrorism. Along with such monetary contribution in the fight against terrorism, New Delhi is always very vocal about this global threat. India has called for international solidarity to hold responsible under international law the countries that use cross-border terrorism. At the United Nations, India has emphasized that nations using terror to serve their narrow political interests must be held accountable, which would only be possible if states stand in unison against the global menace. The remarks came when India's representative at the UN, Ruchira Kamboj, was speaking on the debate of the rule of law among nations on January 12. The application of the rule of law at the international level should protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states from aggression, including terrorism and including cross-border terrorism. States that use cross-border terror to serve narrow political purposes must be held accountable. This is only feasible when all countries stand together against common threats such as terrorism and do not engage in double standards for political expediency. Speaking further on the debate, India's representative at the UN put forward the country's viewpoint on the matters critical for the conduct of rule of law among nations. Kamboj emphasized that all disputes should be resolved through peaceful means. She said that the principles of multilateralism and peaceful settlement of disputes in accordance with principles of international law can only succeed if the interaction between states is based on rules that aspire for greater collective welfare. Mr. President, the purpose and relevance of multilateral organizations is increasingly being put to question. We have a collective responsibility and obligation to enhance the credibility and legitimacy of the international order. Let us strive to achieve this before it is too late. New Delhi has been engaging with everybody around the world in order to curb the menace of terrorism. It has urged everybody to be on the same page when it comes to combating a common enemy. However, it has also been seeking reforms when it comes to working methods of subsidiary bodies of the Security Council. India warned these regimes to remain under constant review so that they can keep pace with the changing situation on the ground. An extra push comes in the backdrop of Pakistan's intensified multi-layered efforts at infiltrating terrorists into the Indian territory, denting harmony by stoking fanatic passions and flaring separatist agenda by working overtime to indoctrinate youths of Kashmir. Although they have been responded with an iron fist, India's aim is to bring a perennial state of peace in the country and around the world. And for that, all it has been demanding is an integrated response to terrorism, no matter where it is emanating from.
Let us now turn our attention to India's Jammu and Kashmir, where the security forces have started a number of operations to dismantle the network of Pak backed terrorism. Islamabad is making desperate attempts to launch infiltration bids in the region. However, Indian Army, with the help of Jammu and Kashmir police, is putting an end to these terrorists with a commitment to upholding peace and tranquility in the area. Recently, security forces foiled a major infiltration bid through the line of control in Balakot sector in Poonj district and killed two Pakistani terrorists. Our report. Jammu and Kashmir has remained at the target of Pakistan's state-sponsored terrorism since decades. Be it deadly terror attacks, cross-border infiltration or indulging into narco-terrorism, Islamabad has not differed itself from indulging into anti-Indian activities. Recently, a major terror attack was foiled in Jammu and Kashmir as Indian security personnel thwarted a major infiltration bid through the line of control in Balakot sector of Punch district and killed two Pakistani terrorists. According to police officials, they were heavily armed with AK rifles, steel core AK ammunition that can pierce through bulletproof vehicles, Chinese pistols, grenades and other ammunition. The terrorists were also carrying the army's combat uniform. That indicates they were tasked to attack some military formation. January uh, 2023, at approximately 1900 hours, own alert troops observed suspicious movement of two terrorist infiltrators who were trying to sneak in across the line of control in Balakot sector of Punch district. Troops come in search at 0200 hours on the 8th of January. The search was deliberate as the area was not just undulating with dense undergrowth but also heavily mined. In the search so far, Two bodies have been recovered with weapons, magazines, ammunition and other warlike stores. The army has recovered one AK-47 rifle, one modified AK-56 rifle, one Chinese pistol, two Chinese hand grenades, two heavy high explosive IED devices and one mobile phone. Search operations still continue. For the Indian soldiers at this frontier, it's a battle that has to be fought on two fronts, hostile neighbor and harsh winter, which is approaching. While the infiltration remained largely under control last year, the possibility of Pakistan returning to its old ways of making increased attempts to sneak more terrorists ahead of the winter. Besides infiltration of terrorists, the Indian Army is also worried about the flow of drugs from across the border. As per the Ministry of Home Affairs, there has been more than 75% decrease in net infiltration from across the border between 2018 and 2021 and more than 80% reduction in the number of terrorist incidents during the same period. Despite such efforts by the security forces, in eliminating those infiltrating the line of control, the drug menace has not abated. In order to target youths and channeling finance for Pakistan-backed terror activities, Islamabad is using narco-terrorism as a new weapon in its proxy war against India in the Kashmir Valley. Pakistan's formal economy is in a poor state. Everyone knows that the narco money is being used to fund the terrorists as well as to generate money through irregular means and therefore with Haqqani in the government in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan finds that this is a lucrative trade and therefore the drug cartels are trying every possible means to send the narcotics into India and create a market and also spoil the new generation. Uh, they would like to certainly find a number of means wherever they can induct it easily 
whether through drones or through coast or through Gujarat coast or whichever coast they find that the security is slightly lax. And therefore, I think they will exploit all possible uh, means uh, to induct narcotics into India. Pakistan's efforts to undermine normalcy in Jammu and Kashmir, particularly after the August 2019 constitutional reforms, is rooted in its decades-long proxy war against India. Its diplomatic efforts both bilaterally as well as raising the issue at various international fora have been limited to malign India and to portray that bilateral approach have failed. Islamabad must end material support for terrorism in Kashmir if regional peace is to be assured. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.